Hey guys, um, wanted to step a little bit off the path today and um, kind of go back and talk about something that uh, people don't usually talk about in a physics class. Um, this is what we're doing in physics. This is the whole point, the whole game here, but um, this isn't something that usually gets brought up. So let me just kind of throw you a freebie here and uh, let you think about what all these formulas mean and, and how they work, and maybe give you a glimpse into how people cook this stuff up, where physics came from, how it got developed. Okay, um, A mathematical model is very simply using mathematics to model the behavior of something. Um, I like to build real boats, but I'll usually go build toy boats first, a little model boat, to kind of see how the pieces are going to fit together, see how, how the parts move. Maybe you built little plastic models, car models, airplane models, or something as a kid. Um, that toy tells you something about the real thing. And when you open up the hood and you see a little silver piece of plastic there and go, yeah, that's the valve cover, you know, you learn something about how a real car works and the model leads to understanding. The model helps you understand the real thing. Um, it's important to remember that it's just a model, but it, it leads us to understanding the real thing. Okay, so a mathematical model is a description of a system using mathematical concepts and language. Um, we use formulas, we use numbers, we use uh, uh, equations. A model helps explain a system, study the effects of different components. What happens when the temperature changes? What happens if the resistance changes in electricity? What happens? You know, all of those kind of questions. As this changes, how does that affect something else? These different components, different factors. Uh, and then make predictions about what's going to happen. Um, and then here at the end, you can see that uh, we're using variables, constants, and constraints. A variable is a number that can change. So let's say we're trying to predict how many tires there are in the parking lot at school. Maybe there's uh, some need to know how many, how many tires there are. Well, we could go and um, count the number of cars. That number of cars is going to change throughout the day as people arrive for school. Of course, nobody arrives at school anymore, but, but uh, as people come and go, that number of cars is going to go up and down. The constant there would be four. There's four tires per car, right? I guess if you want to count the spare tire, that would be five. But um, four on the on the parking lot there. And uh, so that would be a, an example of a constant. We could say, well, I'm counting four tires per car. My variable, the number of cars are going to go up and down. Um, a constraint on a problem is something that kind of limits it in some way or other. Uh, for example, there's only so many parking spots in the uh, in the parking lot. You can only get so many cars in and then the parking lot's full and you got to go somewhere else. So that would be an example of a constraint on a problem uh, using a mathematical model. Um, anyway, here's the uh, the most basic first kind right here. This is called direct variation and um, you have a formula here that you can see. Um, we have a lot of these in uh, in physics. There is some formula that takes this form right here, there's an equation, some variable equals some constant times some other number of, of things. If this is the uh, talking about the number of tires in the parking lot, x could be the number of cars, and when I multiply by, far, by 4, that would be the number of tires there. All right. Um, there's a direct variation. As this number goes up, that number goes up. If I were to graph this, you could see it would look like this. Number of cars goes up, the number of tires goes up. And so we talked about a direct variation having that form right there. <clears throat> now, um, the example that I have here on the, on the graph is uh, ice cream. Let's say you, you had a little cart and you loaded it up in the morning and you pushed it through the park and uh, sold ice cream in the park, right? And maybe every day you're trying to figure out how many ice creams to put in your cart to make sure you have enough. Well, the temperature is a factor. The hotter it gets, the more people are going to want ice cream. So that would be a direct variation. And you could kind of plot some data over the course of some time and say, well, here's how many ice creams I sold when it was this temperature, right? And uh, here I sold 20 ice creams when it was this temperature. Build a little model. And then that that model kind of tells you something, well, tomorrow it's supposed to be 25. I probably need to put this many. 
Um, that's extrapolation. We're reaching out past what our data has told us and trying to figure out what's going to happen. Or maybe it's going to be 17 tomorrow. That's kind of in between the data points, so we interpolate. We, we get in between the points there. Uh, but those direct variation models are very common in, in uh, physics. Uh, here's some examples, right? We just got finished doing kinematics where we had a number of variables uh, the velocity depended on the initial velocity. That's a variable. Uh, it depends on the acceleration. That's a variable. It depends on the time. That's, an, that's a variable. And so we built this model to say the final velocity is equal to all that stuff and the displacement. and <clears throat> Those are really mathematical models. And uh, they're all direct variation. I'll, I'll tell you how you know that in just a second. But uh, as the acceleration gets bigger, the velocity gets bigger. As the time gets bigger, the velocity gets bigger. As the initial velocity gets bigger, this gets bigger. All right, so everything's a direct variation there. Um, here's a little example of direct variation. Uh, it says a lawn fertilizer should be spread in a ratio of 20 pounds to every thousand square feet. How much fertilizer should be used to treat a lawn that's 700 square feet? All right, so I've, I've already set up the direct variation model here as my area A gets bigger and bigger, the uh, pounds of fertilizer here, F, should get bigger and bigger. Bigger area, I need, I need more fertilizer. All right, And this K is a constant that's going to say how many pounds per uh, square feet or acre or whatever the units are here. Okay, So I've got my basic model set up. I need to find out what K is. And then I can use it to solve the second sentence there, that question about 700 square feet. So all I have to do is say, well, I've got some data here, and 20 pounds of fertilizer works real good for 1,000 square feet. So I could come in here and say, here's 20 pounds, and that's equal to some constant times 1,000 square feet. All right, I just put those numbers in, and now I can solve this thing for K. I'd have 20 pounds divided by 1,000 square feet, and that would be 0 0.0, um, I need to move the decimal place three times, so 0 0.02 pounds per square foot is equal to K. I left the equal sign out up here. All right. Now that I know K, I can take it and put it back into my formula. So now I've got a kind of a, a new and improved formula that says F equals 0 0.02 pounds per square foot times the area. And since I'm interested in this 700 square feet, that could be one of the numbers that I plug in right here. And uh, do you see how that formula kind of teaches us something we didn't know and, and the utility of, of being able to build that? Uh, the square feet cancel out here. I'm left in pounds. That's what I wanted. 0.02. I need 14 pounds of, uh, of fertilizer here. 0 0.02 times 700 would mean I'd need 14 pounds. All right. So that's just kind of an example. Maybe that seems kind of silly, whatever. But uh, everything that we're doing here is simply using a mathematical model to say, how does this work? What's going on here? And uh, we do do it in all sorts of different ways. Sometimes it's a, a lawn care thing. Sometimes it's physics. All right. Here's the second model, the inverse variation. Uh, an inverse variation model has this form y equals a over x divided by x. If I put the other variable on the bottom, and, and this a is my constant. If you want to call it k, that's fine. All right. But uh, it would have some kind of form like this. Um, the direct variation was on top, y equals 4x, and now I've got this inverse, or indirect, sometimes people call it. Um, so this, this is not what we're talking about here, but uh, that, that last one worked like that. I'll cross it out here, but uh, just kind of for reference, this is what we're doing here. The variable is on the bottom, if you want to write it the other way, just to kind of make it easier to see. It looks like that. When you see a variable on the bottom and x gets bigger, if I divide 4 by a bigger and a bigger and a bigger number, it makes y smaller and smaller. So its graph would look something like this. 
and uh, remember we sold ice cream and there was a direct variation with temperature. Here, if I'm out in the park trying to sell winter hats, the hotter it gets, the fewer hats I sell. As the temperature goes up, then my sales are going to go down, and I'm going to see a curve that looks something like that. That's the inverse variation model. The takeaway I want you to kind of know and think about, every time you see a formula, if there's a variable on the top, that's a direct variation, and as that number gets bigger, your answer gets bigger. Whenever you have a variable on the bottom, like you see here, when x gets bigger, this gets smaller. And those are the kind of the two main models that we use in physics. Um, here is a little example of this. Uh, the time taken for a water heater to boil water is inversely proportional to the power of the water heater. Okay. Um, so I've already set this up. They told me it was inversely proportional, and that's all that means. It says set it up like that. Set it up so that you've got uh, some kind of constant, and the variable P, the power, is um, on the bottom here. As my power gets bigger and bigger, it's going to boil water faster, so the time is going to go down, and uh, we could set it up like this. We're going to pull the same trick again here. They give me the power. Uh, they give me the time for one data point, so I can kind of come in here, and I can say, great, here's 240 seconds, and here's K. Don't know what that is yet, but uh, I got 2,000 watts uh, heating that water, and I could solve that for K. Just multiply both sides here by uh, 2,000, and I'll get a uh, 480. That's the 2 times the 240, and then I got 1, 2, 3 more zeros, so we'll tack those on there. You can multiply, multiply it out by uh, thing, but I'll have watts times seconds. That constant does two things. It kind of scales the formula to the right size, so you get the right number out. It also fixes the units, so whenever you see a constant in a formula, kind of realize it's doing double duty for you there. Um, now I can take that... Uh, constant and put it in here 480,000 watt seconds and divide by the power that's my new and improved formula that's the specific uh, formula like that and um, when I have some other kind of power here find the time it takes to boil water when the power is a thousand watts you put a different water heater you're going to get a different number here but I got a formula that tells me how it works and uh, when I put a thousand watts down here, the watts are going to cancel there. I'm in seconds like I want to be because I'm looking for time. And uh, this thousand is going to cancel that thousand. I got 480 seconds. Okay. Now it would be easy to come in here and say, well, if I cut the power in half, I'm going to cut the, I'm going to double the time, right? But um, this this formula is just a model that expresses that whole relationship, and. Uh, that's kind of the point of what we're doing here. All right. Um, lots of things in physics have multiple factors. It's not just one thing where, you know, the power of the water heater affects the time. I've got several things going on. And here's a good example. Um, if you take some hot stuff over here, here's some, uh, you know, it could be, let's say it's summertime. And this is the outside of the window. And here's your window right here. And here's the nice, cool inside. You're going to have heat flow from hot to cold, like that. And we may well need to know how fast it's, how fast that heat is going to move through the glass of the window and heat up the inside. All right. So this is a little formula that we actually see in second semester physics. Q stands for heat, T for time. Uh, here's a constant. All right. Uh, a is the area. If you have a bigger window then that's going to be more heat per second. The heat's going to flow faster through a bigger window than a smaller window. So I need to put that A on the top of the formula. It is a direct variation. As the area gets bigger, the heat per time gets bigger. So I put it on top. Right here, delta T is the change in temperature, the difference in the temperature between outside and inside. If it's 104 degrees outside, and uh, we're trying to keep it 63 degrees inside. Hope it's not. That's too cold in my mind. But uh, you're going to get one 
rate of flow through there. Um, if it's only 70 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a smaller temperature differential, so the heat's not going to flow as much. There's not as much difference, so you don't get as much energy transmission between outside and inside. Um, as the change in temperature goes up, the rate of energy flow goes up. Okay, It's a direct variation. Boom, you put it on the top. When it's bigger on top, you get a bigger answer. That's direct. All right. On the other hand, L here is the thickness of the glass. This distance from here to there is L or D or whatever you want to call it. Here it's L. And uh, that thickness of the glass matters because the heat's got to work its way all the way through the glass. If you had a piece of glass that was four inches thick, that would slow the heat down. A bigger thickness makes a smaller heat per time. So that's going to be an inverse relationship, and it's got to go on the bottom of the equation. And uh, I get that formula right there, and, and that's the formula that we work with in second semester physics when we're thinking about heat and thermodynamics and all of that stuff. Uh, we won't do it in here in first semester physics, but uh, I think it's a good example. Here's, though, one that we do in this class uh, when we talk about gravity for test four. Uh, and how much gravity there is. Maybe this is the Earth and the Moon here, or maybe it's the Sun and the and the uh, the Earth, or you know whatever. But pick any two things you want: a banana and a paper clip, right? Each has mass, so there's a gravitational attraction between them. And Newton sat down, Isaac Newton, 400 years ago, and he cooked up this equation. He said, I know as this gets bigger, it's going to have more mass, so that's going to put more force, F, in the picture. And if this were bigger, that would uh, increase the amount of, of gravitational attraction, the force. And so those are both direct variation. As M1 gets bigger, F gets bigger. Put it on top. M2 gets bigger, F gets bigger. Put it on top. On the other hand, R is the distance between these two. And as that gets bigger, then the force gets smaller. It doesn't feel that influence as much. And in fact, it's actually an inverse square law is what we call this. Uh, we see a lot of these inverse square laws. And uh, we can talk more about that another time. But uh, he knew that had to go on the bottom. He, he had a really clever way of showing that it had to be an inverse square law like that. And that cooked up the force, leaving this constant. G is, is the constant. We could call it K if we wanted to. But uh, another guy, Cavendish, came along and, and measured the value of that number. And you can go look up his experiment if you want. It's pretty interesting. But um, he also measured the, uh, the mass of the Earth with, with uh, his setup. Um, but that's a formula that has one, two, three variables. Uh, the mass of the first object, the mass of the second object, and the distance between them would be the three constant. I'm sorry, the three variables. I've got a constant right here, and that's going to affect how how much force there is here, right? So three factors they're all coming together uh, to do that. When you look at an equation, realize that things are on the top because as they get bigger, the answer gets bigger, and things are on the bottom because when the denominator gets bigger, the answer gets smaller, and somebody watch the pattern and saw what was going on and said, how does this work? And built a little model to express that. All right, there are some other models here I wanted to talk about just real quick. I'm going to just flip through these. Um, if you have exponential growth, then you get a curve that looks like this. Maybe it's getting four times bigger every every day, right? Maybe you've got a, a dish of mold. Maybe you left some uh, some some food in the refrigerator too long, right? And uh, it's got a little bit of mold, and the next day it's got four times as much mold, and mold, mold, mold. Uh, it just keeps multiplying by four. So we get this exponential here, four raised to the power x. And you could count off how many days, 17 days into this. You could take four to the 17th, and that'd tell you how many mold uh, cells there are there. All right, exponential growth. Here's exponential decay. Uh, radiation, for example, you dig up a rock of uh, uranium or something, you put it on the counter, you measure how much radiation it has, and uh, you come back in a certain amount of time, it'll have half as much, and half as much, and half as much. And we talk about the half-life of, of radioactivity. Okay, um, Here, this one is set up a f 
you know, it's going down by a factor of four every time. So it goes from uh, 100%, one here, falls to a fourth, uh, uh, yeah, it cuts that in, in four. So down to 25%, down to uh, about six and a quarter percent. And, and, and every time it clicks off one to the right, it uh, you divide by four. Remember that a uh, a negative exponent there really kind of inverts. I could also write it that way, couldn't I? But it's on the bottom, and as that gets bigger and bigger, this is going to get smaller and fall off like you see there. So that's an exponential decay model. Uh, here's an interesting one, exponential growth to a maximum. Uh, if you're thinking about the number of fish that can survive in a pond, there is some hard, fast physical limit right here on how many fish can live in that pond. Um, there's only so much oxygen in the pond. There's only so much food in the pond. Um, and, and at some point, the population is going to climb up and approach that, but then it's going to level off. So whenever you need a model that does something like that, uh, we've got an expression for it right there. All right. Um, some other things work this way too. Uh, cleaning up your, your room or your house or something. If you spend one hour, maybe you get this much of your house clean, right? If you spend two hours, you don't get twice as much. You know, you kind of get to here and three. Uh, people talk about diminishing returns and stuff, and that model kind of kind of talks about that. Uh, sometimes we have more than one equation, more than one formula at a time. Uh, here's an equation right here. And here's another one right here. And um, we need an answer for both of those, a, a solution that satisfies both equations. Uh, we've got a number of methods here to solve those matrices, substitution method, elimination, graphical, numerical, um, all sorts of things. Um, when you draw the graph, you know, one graph's doing like this and the other graph's doing like that. And we're looking for a solution that satisfies both equations. It's right there, okay? So it's really easy to pick it off of a graph if you've only got two variables. If you've got seven or eight or 15 variables, uh, it gets a little bit harder to graph in 15 dimensions. So that's probably when you want to jump in here with a matrix and, and do it that way. Substitution's a good method. Uh, we'll do some of that. Uh, we'll do some elimination method. These, these two will certainly do this semester. So I kind of wanted to throw that out there, give you a, a heads up on that. And... Uh, Here's one that comes up a lot, a cyclical model. If I take a uh, pendulum and I pull it back from the center line here and I let it go, it's going to swing and back and forth and back and forth like that. I could graph its position up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, like that. Um, you could use a sine function or a cosine function to model that behavior. If I take a spring and I put a box on top of it and I push this thing down, and let go. Uh, the spring's going to push it up. Gravity's going to pull it down, up, down, up, down, boing, boing, boing. Uh, its position could be modeled with a, uh, a sine function here. All right. So that's a, a, a thing that comes up sometimes. Uh, here's a fancy one that we don't need to worry about if you're in 201, and we won't do a whole lot with it if you're in 221, but I wanted to throw it in here. Uh, differential equations. Uh, you got to have some calculus to be able to do that. So this is really only for the 221 people. But uh, when I think of a skydiver jumping out of a plane, there's really two forces on him. Gravity is pulling him down, making him go faster and faster. But air resistance, and this uh, isn't something we talk a whole lot about in, in first semester physics, air resistance. But I'll show you the formula uh, when we get to uh, test three. And uh, no, actually test two, sorry. And, uh, and we'll see it. This is the formula right there. 1 half rho a c v squared. See all the factors in there? V is the velocity. So the faster I'm falling, the more drag force I have, the more air resistance I have that's trying to slow me down. Uh, a is the cross-sectional area. See how he's all spread out? He's got a big area. That's a direct variation with the drag force. More area is more drag force. Uh, c is a drag coefficient. That's a number that says what shape is the object. Different shapes are going to move differently through the air. So uh, that would come into play. You'd look that up on a table or something. Uh, this guy right here is the uh, density of the material that, through which he's moving. So if he's moving through air, uh, you've got a number 
there. I think it's about uh, 1.029 or something like that. I, I forget kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay? So it's a whole lot harder to move through water than it is through air because of that variable right there. You've got more drag, more resistance to flow. Anyway, for the model here, I need to think about these two arrows. I say gravity is trying to speed him up. Air resistance is trying to slow him down. Um, Newton says that if I add up all the forces, that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. That's what we're getting ready to look at here in test two. This is going to be the heart and soul of test two. And it always comes back to drawing a little picture and saying, how many forces do I have? And then listing those formulas out. Here, I've got this one as a positive because it's pointed up, and this one as a negative because it's down. All right, but that would be those two forces. You don't need to worry too much about this right here. All right, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is I got V here, and this acceleration can also be written as dV dt, the, der the derivative of velocity with respect to time. That's a calculus thing, so don't worry about it. But uh, whenever you have an equation that has a variable and its derivative, that's what we call a differential equation. And there's lots of those in physics. Uh, we won't do a whole lot of them. They come at higher levels more, more often. Okay, but those are some mathematical models. I just kind of wanted to take a moment and think about uh, what these formulas mean. And hopefully you can kind of see how people cook these things up. And even cook your own stuff up. You know, maybe you've got a big party coming up and um, and you got to figure out how many chairs and tables and cards and plates and all that to, you know, there's a formula for that. You can make math work for you and, and do, you know, your physics. Uh, how does your little universe work uh, with mathematics? So it's kind of a beautiful thing. All right. Uh, thank you.